Hello, I'm Melissa Vance with the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce. The Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce is proud to launch a special series we are calling A Culture of Community. This series is focused on diversity and inclusion in the workforce. Whether a business is large or small, has an existing diversity effort, or is just wading into the waters for the first time, our speakers will help. In our March session, Daryl Gordon of Warnley Youth and Family Treatment Center will inspire you. In our April session, Dr. Minji Parker of IU East will show you that we all have implicit biases. This is the why. In our May session, Belden's L. Mark Charles will show you how they built diversity from the ground up. This is the how. We invite you to lean into this important topic with an open mind and determined to learn something new. Most importantly, look for ways you can make small changes in your circles that will create a ripple effect and ultimately show that we are a welcoming community. We begin this series with Daryl Gordon from Wernley Youth and Family Treatment Center. Daryl has had a longtime presence in Richmond and spoke with attendees on topics covered in his book, Change Does Not Occur in a Flash. Thanks, Valerie. It's a pleasure to be here. We have 45 minutes of good conversation, good dialogue. I, I, was, I was telling uh, our cameraman, traditionally, when I do diversity presentations, I, I don't allow cameras, and, and we don't allow any recordings. Um, and traditionally, these are maybe three to four day series. So I'm giving it to you all in 45 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to give you sort of the highlights, okay, of what we traditionally would do in a, in a four-day process. Um, um, but remember, we are on tape, <laughs> okay? So, so we will, we will uh, operate accordingly. But uh, let's first, let's, let's go straight to the guidelines, right? I think we want to let set, set the stage as to what uh, the day is going to look like and how we should should um, utilize this time for the next 45 minutes. First, I, I, I'm asking you all just to be open, right? Just to really be vulnerable today, right? If you can, because it'll allow our interaction to be that much more stimulating when, when you go through the process. Also, uh, make this experience yours. This is only your experience. Um, ask questions and participate. It is important that you participate, right? Okay, so don't sit on your hands today. You can't sit on your hands today. I'll call on you. Uh, open up, take some risks today. Um, respect the confidentiality. So what you hear, just respect their confidentiality. Please, let's not run out and, and share that. So, so we want to make sure that this is a safe place that we can have this kind of dialogue and discussion. Speak from your own experiences. Um, respect the ideas and opinions of other people. So every, others will be sharing their opinions, and, and, and it, it will be interesting what you hear. Um, just respect it. You may not agree with it, but, but we can respect it. And uh, agree to disagree, and let's just move on. And then finally, let's just have fun, and let's dream uh, this big dream. All right. There is a, a contract we normally have, right? So we normally start out with the contract. That's just my legal background kicking in now. I want to sign something, get something written, right? And, and um, being that we're just doing 45 minutes, I just want to read it to you. Or perhaps somebody else would, who's willing to read that for me? Can, can somebody just, thank you. I guess I'll insert my name here. There you go. I, Tina Conti, understand that it is okay to be imperfect with regard to my understanding of diversity, other cultures, and multicultural concerns. I have permission to reveal my lack of information and or experience in misunderstanding around this topic. I have permission to struggle with these issues and be honest about my feelings. I do not have to feel guilty about what I accept or believe, but I do take responsibility for accepting as much new information and knowledge as I can to challenge myself in examining my attitudes and beliefs. I will attend the full workshop and keep an open mind throughout the entire process. Awesome. Anybody disagree? Anybody wouldn't sign it if I did put it in front of you. 
Awesome. We're all good. So we're, we'll have a great time. All right. So let's, let's just kick it off to, to the uh, behavior points. Diversity and behavior in the workplace, right? So in the workplace, there's a, a and I'm not going to probably, I'm not going to speak to you. We're, we're just going to be interacting a lot, right? But I, I'm going to start off with just a few sort of um, helpful uh, uh, dialogue questions, but, but we'll do more interaction than anything. So under business, you'll see values, you'll see practices, programs, and policies. That's what we value. That's, that's what businesses look for, right? They look for this in their company. They, hey, by the way, we've got to have these practices in place. And, and by the way, we've got to have these programs in place. So that's, that's how business works, right? Now, on the other side, there's individuals. We, we look at values. We look at attitudes, right? We're worried about our families are over there, right? We, we're also probably worried about um, financial security, those things are important to us on the individual side. So it's different. Each, each side have different expectations. Our values individually, I would promise you, are different than the values you have in your business, right? So the practices, we probably don't have that at home. Um, my son wished we had practices at home, but we don't, um, and so on. But, but what we do share is behavior. That is sort of the commonality. <laughs> my behavior is the same at home as it is probably in the workplace. That's when diversity gets a little sticky, right? Because somebody comes in and you don't really know them. You don't know their culture. You don't know how they've been raised. So now I got to figure out how I, how I interact with them in a way that I'm not belittling them, I'm not defending them, but also I'm uplifting them and, and doing all that great stuff, right? So, so just trying to start this conversation understanding Everybody's behavior is different. But unfortunately, we have to bring our home behavior to work. And if I don't know your behavior, what can I anticipate in the workplace? If I'm managing you and I don't know your behavior and you're new on board, what can I anticipate? Misunderstandings. A lot of misunderstandings. What else? What can you anticipate? Some conflicts. Some conflicts, right? Because I just, I don't, I don't know you, right? And, and, and what else, what's one other thing I can anticipate? Discomfort. Discomfort. How, how can I begin to address that when someone new comes on board in my organization? By the way, we have all males in our organization. I've, I got a female that just started last week. It's hypothetical. How, how, what can I begin to do to help alleviate the behavior issue? I think it's important to, to, to lean into cultural intelligence, start asking questions, showing interest. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's building relationships, right? That, that whole process, right? So, so let's, let's, let's change gears here a little bit. So we want to define diversity. Now, I know someone has it on the tip of their tongue. Define, someone just define diversity. For, what does it mean? What is, if you were defining diversity, what is it? Your definition. Something that's different. Hmm? Something, yeah, that's something different. that's different. Something that's different. Amen. Amen. Who else? How about how? Define diversity at that table. Different cultures and different personalities put together in, in a united way. In a united way. You heard what she said? G great. Both right on point. Def help me further define diversity. Education and acceptance. Education, they say, of what? Of different cultures, different people. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Diversity, and how I, I define diversity in many of my classes here, first and foremost, it's a, it's a celebration, mm -hmm. it's an understanding, um, and it's an opportunity to share difference, likability, and use it as an opportunity for educational growth. Very, very well said. Well said. How about not just in cultural, but ages, backgrounds? And what about those ages and backgrounds? Socioeconomic status. Yes, yes, absolutely. Exactly. There we go. Exactly. Religion, right? All that's diversity. I'm going to give you a definition of diversity. I want you to hold on to this, right? I just want you to hold on to this real tight. 
would you read this? Will someone read this for me? Yeah. Please. Sure. Respecting and honoring the gamut of human difference by providing each person the opportunity to contribute and achieve their full potential in meeting the objectives of the organization. Wow, that's a lot of words. Some heavy stuff there, right? Now, somebody break that down for me in layman's terms. What does that really mean? Respecting and honoring the gamut of human difference by providing each person the opportunity to contribute and achieve their full potential in meeting the objectives of your organization. What, is that, what does that mean? Yes, yes. She said to, to, to treat people fairly and equally. Well, I think too along, oh, sorry, were you speaking first? Well, the difference between equality and equity, and I think of this more of an equity thing than okay. an equality thing, because not everybody needs the same things. So this is saying that, well, I respect what you're bringing to the table, and you may need something here to get to the same place that this person needs over here, and we're going to give you equity in the sense that you can achieve it. Yes. Help all of us. Yes. Right. So, so providing from exactly. I think uh, an important addition is uh, the creation of an, an environment where people can safely be themselves. Yes. Um, yes. Without having to um, overly um, mask um, mm -hmm. or, or or try to fit into someone else's uh, mold. Yes. God, I wish I had like days with you guys. This would I, <laughs> this would be great, right? So so. You, so I'm going to give you a story. Now remember this definition. Keep this in mind. I'm going I'm to I'm illuminate this definition for you. There's a story. I, when I was in law school in Kentucky, I lived in Cincinnati. And when I was in law school, the, there was a Fortune 10 company um, in Cincinnati, can't share the name, um, that was looking for a board member. And they were looking for a minority board member that was African American. Okay. Then I, I got the phone call and they said, hey, Daryl, would you be interested in serving on the board? And I said, well, I would love to. I'm, I'm in my first year of law school and I got some other things. It's going to be really tough. I said, but I do have someone that is currently practicing and is an African-American that I think could help you out. He said, okay, pass the name. So I did. And he then joined the board. So when he got to the board, he, he, his first day on the board, right? And I asked, how did you get there? He said, well, the chairman of the board's wife was African-American. And she asked him, honey, why isn't your board diverse? He said, what do you mean? He said, they're all Caucasian men. No women, no Hispanics, no African-Americans. Just, he said, well, I never thought about it. So he said, well, why not just try it? which is how this attorney came about. So now he's in his first day. And you know, the board's been moving on, they're doing different things. So they finally have a product. It's squeeze bottle soap. You guys, all, you probably got it in your bathrooms. Squeeze bottle soaps. The first squeeze bottle soap was coming out. This is gonna be big time. They knew they were gonna make billions on squeeze bottle soap. So somebody stands up and says, listen, I am here today to share with you all that we have a new product and I want to move this for a motion to approve squeeze bottle soap and we will do away with our soap. And the board members, about 18 of them, says, we motion for approval, so I second. Any questions pertaining to the motion? So the brother stood up. First day, first hour, <laughs> he stands up, right, he stands up. He said, well, I know I'm new and I feel a little uncomfortable even sharing at this point. But I just want you to know, in our culture, we use soap and rags. We don't use squeeze bottle soap. So because you're coming with this new product, I'm just sharing with you, we're probably not going to run to the squeeze bottle. We're just going to find the soap somewhere else. So he was astute enough, the board chair was astute enough to say, hmm. And the chief financial officer was sitting in the corner. And, and they said, uh, ma'am. I said, yes. He said, can you tell me what total revenue was for our bar soap this year? 
She said, we did about a billion dollars. So, okay. He was smart enough to ask the next question. You know the next question? What percentage of that billion was purchased by minorities? Oh, she said, I got that 40%. 40%. They were about to make a vote to disband bar soap and disband $400 million in a swoop, just like that, gone. Not because they intentionally wanted to do it, they, they just didn't have the cultural perspective, right? So after that meeting, he comes home and, and he said, hey, hey, Daryl, I, I said, how'd the meeting go? He said, well, it was interesting. They were about to vote on taking soap out. And I was just telling them about our culture. And they were so thankful. He said, I said, well, and then he went back. I said, well, tell me what happened when you went back to the board meeting. He said, when I went back, there was a, two females. There was a Hispanic on the board. <laughs> there was an Indian on the board. They moved quickly and swiftly. Now think about this. How long and how many dollars did they lose as a result of not having the cultural perspective. To be honest with you, I'm sometimes uncomfortable with people that are not exactly like me, that's okay, but I do know they bring value, right? And I do know, I think in just one way. I just got a narrow thinking of how Daryl lived in my cultural background. That's why I try to pull as many people in and have a diverse leadership team, a diverse board, because I know they bring different perspectives, right? So, so that experience was groundbreaking for many organizations, especially the Fortune 500 companies, to say, listen, we got to start, this is affecting our financial expectations and the, and the stockbrokers and the, those who are investing in our companies, right? We're, we may be losing money. So as a result of that, we moved to the continuum. We call it understanding diversity and creating continuum. There are five continuums. You, you really need to know about this, right? It first starts with social marginalization. That's, that's the far left. That's where we hope um, we move away from. Now, does anybody, can anybody tell me what social, um, societal marginalization is? What, what, somebody define that if you can. What is societal marginalization? If, if your organization falls in societal marginalization or if we are involved in societal mar marginalization, what is that? Some feel inferior or yes. less than worthy. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? So margins are the size yes. of things, right? So mm -hmm. anything that's not in the margin is, is in the center. So the things that are considered uh, important, things that are prioritized, um, those types of things are those things that fall into the center of whatever it is you're, yes. you're talking about. Yes. So those move to the margins, those that have been marginalized are generally not prioritized, not considered, um, not thought about, and, um, and generally ignored. Absolutely, absolutely. Right on point. Anybody else? So organizationally, I would say that there's a lack of emphasis or um, an understanding of the impact of diversity, and it's not a priority. Yes. Yes, well, right on point. So, so as you guys are explaining, in social and societal marginalization, I kind of break it up into three particular categories. One, I, I break it up into um, social exclusion, right? That was one part of social marginalization. Is it, what is social exclusion? Think about, um, think about the water fountain opportunities back in the day. That was social, that was social exclusion. Think about the bus rides, you know, where you sat. That was social exclusion, right? Think about the military and the female that wanted to be in the military. There was social exclusion during that time. There wasn't nothing in writing. It was just social exclusion, right? Or, or, or male nurses, right? It, there was an exclusion. Well, I'm not sure we want to hire the male nurse, right? It, that, that's, that was part of societal marginalization. Then under that also systemic blocks, right? There were systemic blocks that also existed. We, we're all aware of those. Those are sort of the voting was a systemic block. Um, education was a systemic block, the blocks there. Being on the police department, being on the fire department, those were all systemic blocks. 
that existed. And it was tough living in that kind of environment. And then there was, the final was the um, um, denial of full access, right? So we're all aware of that. That's housing, right, was denied, health care was denied, and due process was even a uh, denial process. That was a very tough time. Some say it still exists. You know, I think it depends on the environment where you live. As a result of that, we move to the next phase of the diversity continuum, which is the affirmative action. Right? Remember that? You guys remember affirmative action? What was affirmative action? What was, a, what was affirmative action for? It was supposed to uplift certain communities that they felt were being marginalized. There, yes. But it created an atmosphere where uh, people felt they were, well, whether it's VA, whether it's because of your race or ethnic background, that you're just getting this this leg up because That's you right. really don't deserve it on your merit. It's yes. just because you can label yourself. Amen. You're right on point. Yeah. Dead on, right? That's bullseye. So, so it, it's, you know, when you think about that, she's, she's right on point. It's, it's, it was actions and policies, right? They put these actions and policies in place um, that were focused on those that were suffering from, the, from being marginalized. Because it was so bad there, the government had to do something. And they said, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And then we moved away from there. And we went to valuing diversity. And, and valuing diversity was a little different. It was... It was Organizations and individuals say, we recognize diversity and valuing, but we're not going to implement it. <laughs> we're just going to value. We appreciate what you're doing, but goodbye. Okay, we got it now, and, but we're not implementing anything, right? That, that's where a lot of people sat now that, you know, the affirmative action was moved, and they say, hey, okay. Now people are like, listen, I appreciate you recognizing you got the signs up and everything, but nothing's happening in the business, right? That was the challenge. Then we started moving a little further along, managing diversity. Corporations and organizations started saying, listen, almost like the Fortune 10 company. They started saying, we, we got to start figuring out how we implement this in the organization. So managing diversity was more like it's a competitive necessity. If we want to stay alive, we're going to have to begin to implement different philosophies, different ways of looking at things, um, um, understanding people's uniqueness as an asset to success. Everybody brings something different to the table. That, that attorney brought something different to it. He brought 400 million ideas, dollars, to the table, right? Um, also, it's a win-win for everybody wins in managing diversity, everybody. It, it's where you want to be in your life, and it's where you want to be in, in that perspective. But I think more importantly, it's getting beyond your fears and your prejudices. So, so that's, I think, a place where um, we all aspire to be if we're not there already in our organizations, in our, in our, on our boards, in our teams, um, in our personal lives. And then there's the final. Requires no explanation. Celebrating it. <laughs> you are actually testifying to people how awesome this opportunity is. You're like, listen, man, if you don't have a diverse workforce, you are missing it, right? Like, how can you not, right? Like, you, you are telling other people, like, hey, I'm on the, girl, the girls' club of America. I'm the only guy. And you got to be on that. You, how do you not have a guy on the girls' club, right? Because those girls need to know how to interact with Daryl because they have to meet and talk to Daryl sometimes, right? So it's, 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 that's when you're at a point where you, you're telling everybody about the goodness of, of the product and how it's changed the organization's life. Okay, maybe I can, I can, reson I can help you resonate this in a story. So, so I can bring all three, I think I can bring all of this out in a story. And um, I hope you followed a little bit of Notre Dame, but, but <laughs> just a little. But, but a great friend of mine, uh, but before I do, I'm gonna ask these two questions. Where do you guys think the Fortune 5 company fell on this continuum. The story that I gave you, where did you think they fell on this continuum? How many years ago? Yeah, it was the beginning and the end. It was the, the beginning and the end. It sounded like affirmative action to me. 
And the beginning or the end? The beginning, when they wanted somebody of a different color on this board. It sounded okay. more like affirmative action at that point. Okay. You agree with her when she said affirmative action? Did it seem like affirmative action? No, because the only reason why that was even raised as a question was because one person's spouse, who happened to be black, suggested it. So okay. as an organization, they themselves were not even thinking about it at all. That's such a so they're a social societal marginalization. Do we all agree? Possibly? Right, so, so great point, because the, the wife, you know, the wife's not happy, nobody's happy. Right? So, so he went and made that change quickly. Smart man, right? So at the end of the day, they probably sat there, not knowing. It, there was no intention of malice or anything like that. They just didn't know because they didn't have the cultural perspective on it, right? So now, where do you think your organization falls on this paradigm? Because I, I would also ask, where do you think they are today? You may not know where they are today, right? Because you may not know the organization. So, where do your board or organization fall on this paradigm? That's willing to share. What, what do you, just, it's okay. And again, I'm, do not think you all are supposed to be sitting and celebrating diversity. That's why we're having this conversation, right? And, and you're all probably not sitting and managing diversity. You know, I, so, so it's okay. We're, again, we're open, but this is how we're gonna learn and grow. What do you guys, who's willing to share where you guys think you fall? Uh, just my personal experience. I'm tired of the company now, but celebrating diversity. And why? Because they have uh, several affinity groups, you know, not just for race, but for sexual orientation, military, things of that nature. And each of those affinity groups has a diverse, a diverse board, you know, of upper management that supports them. And, uh, push their initiatives, and uh, I, just, I don't know, I just feel like as an African-American organization that we're celebrated yes. for that. Awesome, awesome. That's good when you can, you can say that, right? It's good when you, you feel like somebody else has benefit, benefited from it, right? It's a win-win. Anybody else? Sure, yeah. I would say Ivy Tech, um, as a college, we are probably still at affirmative action, but moving towards valuing diversity. And the reason I say that is because we've, we've only had diversity as a strategic imperative for two years. So we are still young in that space. Gotcha. I'll yeah. stand. Yes. So, so I can appreciate your perspective and your, and your vulnerability, right? And sharing where he believes they are. And it sounds like he wants to move them. Right, to get the full effect of all of your people that are, that are working there. Um, let me go to the story that will help illustrate the continuum. Um, the guy who recruited me from Moeller High School, Coach Jerry Faust, was the head coach of the University of Notre Dame. And, and, and unfortunately, in five years, he was let go. And, and it, he was the nicest, the kindest, the most spiritual. We prayed before every game, we prayed after every game, we prayed in the middle of a game. I mean, he, you, my mom was like, Daryl, that's where you're going, because I trust him, that he would take care of you, and he means well. Now, when he recruited, he, he you know, recruiting is very important in the, in the game of football, just like it is in your corporations. Recruiting is important. And this is how he recruited. From a par parental perspective, he wanted to make sure that every kid that he recruited, their mom and dad was married. That, that was an expectation. If your mom and dad was married, he would frown upon that. Also, economic, he wasn't really going into the, 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 the poverty stricken areas. He wanted to be in the affluent areas. He felt like they could assimilate better, kids could assimilate better in that environment. He then looked at the educational background. Most of those kids that he recruited went to Catholic schools. He said, well, this, you know, if I get them at Catholic schools, they come to Notre Dame, it's just going to be easy, right? They just continue to do mass. How many Catholics do we have in the room? Outstanding. So it's an easy, pro well, we won't have to teach and learn, right? It, and then he also had physical appearance. He said, listen, I want those, my players to look like football players. Like, I don't want them looking like cooks. 
or something else. He wanted them to look like football players, even if they couldn't play. <laughs> right? If, they were, if you're 6'9 and you're 320, wow, wow that's what I, I love that, right? So, so, and religion, from a religious perspective, um, they preferred, um, um, as I indicated, the, the, the Catholic perspective. But geographically, you, you know, and he wasn't rigid on the, in this process, but I'm just saying he, he swayed to um, the geographical location more in the affluent areas, more in the rural um, areas, not the urban areas. Right, that's just, again, he felt like they could perform better at the institution if they went there. Now, unfortunately, it didn't work out well, right? It, it just didn't work out well. Now, after five years, a new coach comes on board, Lou Holtz. Um, again, a great guy, great friend, considered one of the best coaches um, in collegiate athletics, uh, won a national championship in three years. In three years, he was able to win a national championship. So we asked the same question. I got the opportunity to sit down and I said, tell me how do you recruit, right? Like we do in our own organizations. And how does diversity work within that process? He said, well, parentally, Dara, I did not look at whether mom and dad was married or not. I just looked at the character of the child. That was important for me. And then he said, from an economic perspective, I didn't care if they were poor or if they were rich. That wasn't one of my measuring sticks. So that wasn't even there. I said, okay. He said, also from an educational perspective, we went to the private schools, we went to the Catholic schools, we went to the public schools. If you could play football, <laughs> you, you would have an opportunity to attend the University of Notre Dame. So he said, I said, okay, that's, that's, that's fair. Physical appearance? He said, actually, I, I recruited a kid that was 5'11", 285 pounds. <laughs> Running back. If you know what a running back is, this is the guy who carries the ball. And they're normally 190 pounds. Okay, you with me? So he went totally outside the norm, right? And then religious-wise, he, he did not care. You know, most of the kids on the team weren't even Catholic. But there were a percentage that were. And, and then finally, geographically, he would go into the toughest neighborhoods to see if he could get a kid and help change a kid. Just like we do at Warren, right? You, you try to find the toughest kid and see if I can pull him out and give him a life, right? The difference here is he wins a national championship and he sees diversity as an... Somebody tell me, what, what do you see from the distinguishing two differences? What's, what comes to mind when it relates to diversity? Acceptance. Of? Of diversity. Yes. I mean, of differences. And how did he do that? by really not putting any um, entity into a box. I mean, he was open to all. Yes, yes. Was the Fortune 5, Fortune 5 company open to all in the beginning? No. Okay. And how did that, do for, how did that work for them? Uh, probably not well yes. um, until the wife said something. But then <laughs> I would say they went to the celebrating diversity. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Any, anyone else ha regarding the distinguishing differences or similarities? So I'd like to take it a step further than yes. acceptance, okay. right? Because it kind of suggests that, you know, we're allowing you to be here in spite of this difference that you and I have. Yes. I, I think that we really start benefiting from diversity mm -hmm. when you're celebrating those differences and acknowledging what they bring to the table and giving yourself an opportunity to learn from that different person's perspective. Oh, okay. Good point. Yes. Go ahead with your bad self. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, better, better yet, better yet, let me take this mic off. I'm going to give it to her. Okay? Because now she's given my presentation. Right? Let, let's, go to, let's go to the next slide. Okay? My question is to you. I'm the CEO of an organization. I implemented diversity. That's all good. But at the end of the day, how is it affecting the people that actually come into your organization? Is it benefiting them or I'm just making money off of them? They're just there. Did I bring the women in just because, nah, I just wanted women there? I just wanted a, 
uh, Hispanic on the board, an Indian on the board, I just want them there. Are they contributing? <laughs> so, so let's, let's, this guy, right? Let me just, I th thought I wrote something on, a little bit on him, not that I need to read it, but um, you may all know about him. But I, uh, just, just in small story, right? Hall of Famer, right? Steelers, right? Steelers. <laughs> Glad there's still some Steeler fans left. <laughs> he didn't graduate college because he left early. Jerome Bettis. He didn't graduate college because he left his junior year. However, guess where he is right now? On campus, finishing his degree. Okay, let me, let me keep going. This kid was 5'11", 270 pounds. Remember that kid I was telling you about? That was him. He lived in the heart of Detroit, Detroit, where he will admit he sold cocaine. He didn't go to Catholic school. He went to a public school, right? He, he, his financial situation, he was poor, destitute. He'll be the first to tell you. He struggled, right? But, but Lou Holtz felt like, I can, ex I can help him, and he can help us. Right? There's a win-win here in the environment which he would be in and where he was. Perhaps there could be a win-win for both parties. So physical appearance, religion, geographical locations, all of those were different. Economic expectations, his educational background, public school, right? And parents, his mom and dad was not married. So <laughs> everything totally opposite of Faust. Faust would have never got him in there. Right? It wouldn't have been somebody he would have looked at. At the end of the day, you know, we talk about the benefits of, of this opportunity for him and for him to now be the 10th in rushing all time in the NFL, 10th in rushing, the fifth in touchdowns in the NFL, 10th. Um, he recently retired right after he won the Super Bowl. He is now worth $20 million. What I enjoy most about him is he has two kids, two, two, a daughter and a son. Now, <laughs> you, want to, you want to see something go full circle? Where do you think his kids go to school? In high school. They're in high school. Where do you think they're going? Catholic, Catholic school. <laughs> I'll be, you kidding me? <laughs> Catholic school. When they were, remember now, we're, we may be saying, listen, we want to exclude, because they won't, if you're not Catholic, you may not assimilate really well. What if I can grow the Catholic faith with people? Because now they're experiencing something different. And now you wonder why the Catholic faith is growing. Because you bring more and more people in to just experience something different, right? That's, that's the beauty of this thing, right? That's why I, everybody wins. So, so as we talk about Bettis, you know, a, a, a great friend, and he's doing unbelievable things. Um, he has benefited from this whole process. Now, let's talk about benefit. Notre Dame benefit, they tripled that, that year, they tripled their admissions as a result of their wins and losses. Tripled. They doubled their income as a result of their win and losses with him and others that were diverse, right? Coach Holtz, let's go to the coach. He used to give speeches for $10,000 a speech. After he won the national championship as a result of, of all of us, he now speaks for $60,000 an hour. An hour. Because of diversity, right? He, he is now world famous, right? TV, the whole nine. Jerome Bettis, I just rattled off. Hall of Famer. Fifth in rushing. Tenth in touchdowns. Kids are doing extremely well in Catholic schools. And he's worth 20, maybe, maybe now 30, because he's doubling down on everything he does, right? That's the great story of continuum. Now, where do you guys think on the continuum that Faust was, the first coach? When you look at the continuum, where, where do you think he fell? Marginalization in every aspect. <laughs> And so the question would be, why? Did he intend to do that? 
Why? That's what he knew. That's, that's his life. He, he was looking through his lens only. What he knew. He had his blinders on. Yes. Same exact company. They weren't doing it intentionally. Right. Yeah. Right. They Maybe. didn't know to know anything different that's until right. somebody brought it to their attention. Yep. I practice it. I practiced 20 years when I got here that my board was going to be diverse and my, my, my leadership team was going to be diverse because I already knew the value, right? So you didn't have to, t it wasn't nothing new for me. But there are a lot of people that don't know, like what y'all know right now, that there's value in that. And it's uncomfortable. Think about it. How uncomfortable is it? Sometimes they have somebody on the board or somebody working with you and they're just not like you. Like, ah. But they kill it, right? But they kill it. They just are awesome workers. But you just don't, you just can't connect, right? That, think about it, <laughs> think about it, right? So, so Faust was able to make that work. We had such, a, a, we had such a, an issue, um, that we used to, when Holtz got there, when we go away on way trips, we used to board in, our, in hotel rooms um, with different races. So if I was African American, I'd, I'd, I'd be with an uh, opposite race. So opposite race, not gender. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Don't want that on television. <laughs> <laughs> we have to cut the cut the tape, cut the tape. <laughs> no, no, race, 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 race. No, quite all right, quite all right, quite all right. Happens all the time. <laughs> well, you know, let, let's let's if I can if I can take you to the dimensions of diversity, and um, I think you know when we talk about dimensions of diversity. It's important there's primary and there's secondary dimensions of diversity, right? So um, now that you know what diversity is kind of about, you also need to know that there are two segments. Primary, there are six primary dimensions of diversity. Now I'm gonna give you a hint. In the primary dimensions of diversity, the characteristics of diversity, uh, I'm gonna give you one. One is um, race. There's six of them, right? These are, a must. You, we, we have legal law around these. I'll give, you, I'll give you one more. The other one is age. There's four more. Primary. Characteristics of diversity. What are those four? Gender. Gender. Yes. Ability. Gender and religion, you said? Yeah. Not religion. Cultural orientation. Gender presentation. Gender presentation. We got gender already. Sexual, yes. There's two more. Ability. 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 Absolutely. You guys do well as a team. Mm -hmm. Ethnic ethnicity, the last. Right? You guys had that, right? People are sensitive about the primary characteristics of diversity. Why? It's real easy. Don't think too hard. Well, they're not things that can be changed. There you go. Yeah. You can't change them. So don't tell me, well, hey, um, your daughter can't come into this school. Why? She's a female. Well, God, she can't change. She, she's always going to be a female. Right? So, so people are sensitive around this. Now let me take you to secondary dimensions, right, where you can change. And you're not as sensitive, but you're still sensitive. But you're not as sensitive. I'll give you, I'll give you a start. Give me, let's, I'll put two up there for you. One is physical appearance. One is geographical location. OK? Geographical location and physical appearance. There are 12. Finances. Finances. Economic status. Love it. Education. Education. Yes, there's education. Education background. What else? Marital status. Marital status. Go ahead with your bad self. <laughs> we got left. Children or no children? Uh, close. No. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you that. Personal status. I'll give you personal status. All right. 
history of incarceration? Close. No? Religion, thank you. Yes, absolutely. I can be Catholic one day, I can be Baptist the next. <laughs> right? Huh? <laughs> Acts of your own Baptist. What else? Something y'all are taking a little time off today? From where? Employment, Work. Employment, Work. Status. Employment status. Okay. Education. Education. I think we, we, we've nailed that one. Correct. There's three more. No, uh, no, I'm, it, it was unfortunately not. Okay. Good, 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 good thought. One, uh, you know, we, 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 Fourth of July is important to us. Hmm? Military, somebody said military, right? That's a, you know, two more. Uh, no. Como se llama usted? Language. Language. What did I just say? How are you? No. What's your name? Thank you. <laughs> How you doing? What, what Spanish class did you take? <laughs> That's why it's good to have diversity. You see? Because we would have believed her. I've been talking about, come on, say I'm upstairs. She said, what's your name? No, that's not. All this time I've been saying, come on, say I'm upstairs. It's not her name. It's, How you doing? Me llamo Daryl. Me llamo Daryl. And finally, I'll give it to your personality. Personality. So, um, th these are all of our diversity dimensions and characteristics. We're sensitive to some and, and, and less to others. I want you guys to just take a second and circle uh, two that are personally challenging to you. Circle two of those that you saw either in the primary or the secondary that are personally challenging for you. Yes, I'll put the other slide back up. And the second, the second, there you go. I'll put it right up on your desk. By challenging, you mean people challenge us or we have trouble with others? Uh, either way is acceptable. And the second, I want you to put a square around those that are challenging in your office, in your business, on your team, on your board, put a square around that one. So one is the circle is personal and the square is business. I'm sorry, Carol, reiterate. Are we circling what's challenging to us personally? To us, as it relates to as it relates to us or as it relates to others? As it relates to you all. Okay. So what's challenging to you? What is hard for you to accomplish? What is it is it difficult when you are in in affluent environments? Are you uncomfortable when you're in poor environments? Right? Are you is it challenging for you when you're you know, in front of or around educa educated people? Or are you uncomfortable or comfortable when, when there are people that are rich or poor, right? What, what, are you, what, what are you comfortable with? What are you uncomfortable with? And I'm gonna, we're gonna move the, the close. All right. Who is, uh, and again, we'll just have two people share out. One will share our personal, one will share our corporate, and we'll go to close. Someone help me out. Someone share their personal. What, what, are, what are they challenged um, that are most challenged and challenging to you? Can you define what you mean by challenge? So I, I don't want to pigeonhole. Whatever you feel comfortable in saying that's challenging to you. Perhaps as you look at these characteristics, the, these primary, secondary, Perhaps it's, it, one lady said, she was younger, she was 32, but she was an executive, she said, it's really challenging being young in a corporate world, right? Because she's 32, everybody was 52. So it was challenging for her to try to navigate that environment, right? And someone else says, you know, um, it's challenging um, geographically. I'm from the South, 
And everybody's like, oh, he's from the South. There it goes, right? And, and they don't really want to work, right? It's, you know, it's the South, right? They want to hang on the beach, and, which I do enjoy the beach, right? Um, I'm not from the South. I'm from the East. I don't know if there's any, any stereotype there, but... <laughs> In economic because, status. Because we don't do well with talking about class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's always a challenge to me. I'm on several boards and getting the boards to talk about class issues. Um, particular, because a lot of boards will read managerial stuff, but we never read labor history stuff. Yes, yes. And so, the, so we, we're not looking at all from the perspective of the labor you know, or the, the person in the, in the street. Yes. We're looking from the manager down. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the president and the vice president and the chair yes. and this and that. Yes. But we don't look at what's the, we don't have a lot of literature that we're reading that helps us understand what's going on from the bottom up. So that's, that's a real challenge. Excellent. So I'm going to close with this then. I, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to take you to the stereotypes, right? Again, I, God, I wish I could have had days with you guys because we'd have so much fun, right? Can you do that? <laughs> One day we'll do that. We'll just all come together for a couple days and, and have so much fun. But I'm going to take you right to stereotypes, right? And, and in closing, I want to read this to you. Understanding diversity and creating community will help minimize stereotyping and in societal marginalization, understanding it. Right? Remember, and you guys said it all day today. Well, you know, societal marginalization, they didn't know what they were doing. Like, Coach Holtz didn't know that he was really so societal marginalizing the people there. The, the Fortune 500, they didn't know, right? Two, I want you to fill in this blank. I'm not gonna have you write anything, but this is our close. Fill in the blank with two or three words, maybe one word, that you're, with your first reaction, the first thing that comes in your mind, you got to say it. Okay? You, remember now, we, it's okay. Just, just, just say it, and we keep rolling. Can I say it now? Just get, you sit down. You, <laughs> whatever the first impression. I'm going to start. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go boom, 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 boom. Boom, mm, mm. Okay, and I'll point and we'll just go. But we've got to move fast because we've got to close. Okay, ready? You ready? Yes. Set. Set. Go. Conservative. Gee, uh. <laughs> Come on, come on. It's in there. It's in there. I was going to say something like conservative, so I believe that. <laughs> two, two, two. Okay, okay. Don't be conservative. <laughs> okay, okay, first thing mine. First thing is. Superior. <laughs> <laughs> People of seven X are hilarious. <laughs> Nerdy. Thank you. Latinos are great. Dancers. Dancers. Okay. <laughs> Professional working women are. <laughs> you, 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 you. Oh. Oh. Okay. Uh,
<laughs> okay, all right. Indians on a reservation are usually. Oh, great. There you go, there you go. Puerto Ricans from the inner city are. Creative. Middle Eastern Muslim students are. We can't pass, no, no. Say something. Misunderstood, thank you. Southern California blinds are? Southern California blinds are? Pretty. Pretty. Yeah, you said that. I know where everybody go that. Retired people in Florida are? Lucky. Lucky. The West City California from Wyoming acts like? Masculine. Okay, all right. And Greek sorority fraternity types are? Servants. Servants. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> well, <laughs> this close out perfectly. The last person, the last one. <laughs> Affirmative <laughs> men are? Sensitive. Sensitive. Thank you very much. In closing, this is, this is it's, you know, stereotype is really just generally automatic. I don't care what you say. Inside, it's you're thinking something. But it comes from your culture. It's nothing you can do about it. I don't care how you try to hold it. It is in there. And, and, and we're just trying to help you understand that that exists so you can fight it, right? So it's automatic. We all have them. Are generally false and misleading. They are generally false and misleading. It is what it is, right? It entails judgment, right? And also, every group has stereotype attached to them. So the Hispanics, the African Americans, the whites, everyone has gender, so on and so forth. You can take that home with you and just talk about what's challenging in, internally in your organization, what's challenging externally in your organization, and what's challenging individually for you, and what strategies you want to put together. And she's going to hand that out uh, for you. And in closing, an individual, can, you, can someone close, can you read that, the closing for us? Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but you guys are outstanding. I try to slip 45 into four days, but uh, thank you again and God bless you.